Hi, I'm Margaret Martin at Melio Guide. I'm a registered physiotherapist. Melio Guide is all about aging well with exercise with a special focus on osteoporosis. Today, my special guest is Dr. Janet Rubin. She's a distinguished professor of medicine in the Division of Endocrinology and Metabolism at the University of North Carolina. She's also vice chair of research in the Department of Medicine. On top of all these things, she maintains a clinical practice helping people with their osteoporosis. Dr. Rubin has been investigating bone remodeling for decades. Her particular focus has been on how exercise and mechanical forces affect cell cytoskeleton and how that stimulation alters the stem cell lineage, what they become. So Dr. Janet Rubin, has not only accomplished all of these things, but she's also been voted by her peers onto the list of best doctors in America, a recognition that she's held since 2008. In today's talk with Dr. Rubin, we delve in deep into the definition of what fragility is, the spectrum that exists in the population in terms of fragility, both in genetics, the influence of age, and what the best treatment approach is to stop people from fracturing. Um, let's go to the, in, to the folks that we do worry about a lot more and that contact you and, and me, and those that have started to fracture before the age of 65 or 60, you know, when you see that it is a more natural thing because we're not meant to live this long and, you know, our skeleton is going, letting us know. Um, that we haven't challenged it enough to, to deal with all the stresses that are being imposed on it. And knowing that, you know, I, in the literature, the, the numbers, but change a little bit, but there's, you know, individuals that get DEXA scores, most of them that fracture are not falling into the osteoporotic range. They're osteo actually still osteopenic or low bone, you know, density range, but they're still fracturing. So these are individuals that are much more fragile, or maybe you just, you just see them as regular or expected. Um, but how do you measure the level of fragility that there are? How, how fragile do you see them, I guess? Or, um, so I, I, you know, there's, there's definitely a, a difference between young women, women who haven't, you know, who aren't in their 60s. Um, and the 60s that the most of the people I deal with are, are older people. So young women who fracture, I think there are many things we don't know about them. I think there are some of these young women, we have to consider that they may be on the spectrum of osteogenesis and perfecta, that they may have other secondary causes, and those have to be ruled out. And we're getting, we're getting closer to being able to test for for weird bone diseases like osteogenesis imperfecta with genetic studies, we don't have much to treat them with. So we tend to throw the same agents at them. And that's a, a unique situation. In terms of, you know, being strong or saying, oh, well, this person, you know, there are people with multiple sclerosis, right? They can't exercise or people who have nerve problems. I mean, these people are people who are paraplegic. Each one is a difficult um, issue that you you know that you have to bring out maybe all the guns or all the guns that can work in those patients. Um, you know, you do what you can, but that's not most people. Most ladies are going to fracture postmenopausally. You're saying, you know, if you just let everybody age naturally, that over the age of 65, there would be the average, I guess, above 75% of women are going to have some form of fragility fracture? I think if, the data is over 50, untreated, 50% 50 of women will have a fragility fracture. And you know some of these are undiagnosed because they're in the spine. I think the radiologist, my favorite radiologist here, until I really started spending time with him, he, you know, they don't even read it on a chest X-ray. They just call that little old lady spine. Um, 
you know, and there are, again, things about little old lady spine that we're only starting to understand. I mean, we just had a paper accepted looking at um, scoliosis, you know, so most people who come in, they're not crooked because they've broken bones in their spine. They're crooked because they have scoliosis. And so I wanted to understand whether scoliosis was related to osteoporosis. And it isn't, at least in our study. Um, scoliosis is another disease of aging. It may be arthritic in nature, you know, it's osteoarthritis. But scoliosis is one of those things that makes people fragile, you know, as they get older and they're bending from their lumbars this way, which means they're then going to be bending this way. And that just adds to the whole imbalance that starts to happen to us. I mean, it's even happening to me. I'm 67, fans of Margaret's blog. And, you know, you, you don't see as well and you don't hear as well. So you're already losing your, your position in three-dimensional space. And then if you're, you know, if you can't be upright, um, you, you know, you have a huge fall risk. Yeah. So, I mean, just from my perspective of scoliosis, and then I'm going to move on to another question, but is that because I've gotten to follow women, you know, over 20 years in some circumstances to see the progression of scoliosis as they age and largely as the skeletal vertebral um, musculature starts to weaken the the ability to maintain an, a more upright spine, even with a small scoliotic curve, gravity gets the better of them. I, I so and, totally agree. But you know what? There's very little data on this. The one I found, and there are probably ones maybe in your literature that I don't know, but I have found one study that suggested that men who uh, strengthen their upper back were able to maintain height. That's you know, so I throw that at my patients all the time. You know, I try to throw everything at them to make them work on core. Please work on your core. You need to stand straight. Stand up straight like your mother told you. I'm sure you're used to saying all this stuff. But the data is really not good. So yeah. um, I would love to have a data set that I could throw at my patients and tell them, you know, because no one wants to shrink. You know, nobody wants you know, if you do these exercises, you'll still be five foot six when you're 90, but I don't have that data set. And I'm not sure it would work, but it would definitely help. You know, everything helps. Yes. So changing gears. Um, many individuals contact me, you know, they get a poor DEXA result and they're frightened away from exercising at a time where exercise is actually very important. And the circumstances, are there any circumstances, you know, where based solely on DEXA scores that you would tell someone they should no longer exercise? Because physicians are telling clients that not all, but those that, you know, I hear from, and there, there's... It's the orthopedic guys, I think, that do that. Well, they're telling them don't even roll over in bed because you're going to fracture. So, you know, maybe it's... You know... I think sometimes doctors do this because they don't want to be blamed for things that happen to these people that are very fragile. And, you know, I just say, look at, I am not a magician, but the stronger you are, the better your risk, you know, you lower your risk for fracturing. So if a lady comes in and I know she has new spinal fractures, I usually want to treat her for six months, because that's when we can show that we have efficacy in the spine in terms of new fractures. I might say, don't go horseback riding for the next six months. I've told that to several patients who like to have horseback ride. But then I'm looking at them and their whole life is going to the barn and being happy and riding their horse. I'm not gonna tell them not to ride their horse, period. I think people have to make decisions about how they live. And I think you have to be mindful about how you exercise. So can I tell you one little story? I know you told me not to tell you stories, but 
in, you know, in one of my exercises, there was this thing where, you know, that you would hop up high and you come down and you'd roll like this back and then you come up and hop. And it was just one piece in this half an hour exercise. And I happened to mention to a patient of mine who really strives so hard. I said, you know, this is who I follow. And I wasn't even thinking about this. And she goes home and she does this exercise and she had a spine fracture, right? And so that's kind of like when I said, look it, you need to be thoughtful about how you exercise. You have to exercise, but there's nobody going to be sitting there at every moment with you. If you have somebody like you who can say, this, these are the things I'd like you to exercise this way. But I think most of us don't realize how much we can exercise as we get older. So to your, um, to your original question here, there, is a, there are two studies that actually show that women can increase their hip density, but in, you know, in, in our older period, in postmenopausal period, by doing exercises. And one of them is Belinda Beck's Lift More study. Do you know that study is from 2017? Yep. Um, I wrote it down because I wanted to tell you about it. And I was amazed and impressed that these ladies with horrible spine mineral densities were doing these things where they would hold onto a bar and they'd have them leap up and come down with their weight. And I'm like, I would be scared to do that, but they did that and nobody fractured. Of course, they were all watched and coached. And so yay, if you got, have somebody to do that, but you can do that. And then the other one was by Hartley. I think it was it. So one of them was in Australia and one of them was in New Zealand. And the Hartley study, they have the ladies get up and most little old ladies can't do this, but they like hop on one foot like 20 or 50 times and repeat it three, three times. And believe me, most 75 year olds can't do that, but 65 year olds can. And they gained hip bone mineral density. So you can do it. Um, some people can't do everything. So when I try to tell my patients, you have to exercise, I try to think, what can that patient do? And, and I really don't know. So if you can have a guide to move you, then that would be great. But I never know what the person on the other side is gonna be doing because that's not my practice. You know, I'm in the lab and here and there and I don't have this person that I turn to and I say, you can get with this person. They're gonna help you through this, your trainer. I mean, you might have a trainer I had a lady who was like a ski champion. She was like totally fractured from being ski. And her trainer was like having her bench press 150 pounds. I'm like, what is the point? You're 75 years old. Do you really need to press 150 pounds? Um, so, yes. So I'm very familiar with the Lift More study. And yeah, that bothers me when then I hear about trainers that are now, you know, taking on the osteoporotic world, world and going, we can get you all doing, you know, heavy squats, you know, and yet they're often working with them remotely. And that's not what lift. And they're did. falling they, over. Oh, goodness. You know, so what lift more did for me was when, you know, yes, it is safe to make people work at their heaviest, comfortable with good form, because that's what the trainers ensured, but I would never have them work in their home um, in a position of, of an 80 rep max, 80%, you know, one RM, because you need a spotter when you're lifting you that. Heavy. But they can still work out in their homes. Absolutely. Yes. And they better be doing that if you're my patient. Yeah. But then when you come back next year, I'm going to say... <laughs> 